religious persecution, religious freedom, the persecution of Christians both in America and around the world. That's the topic of today's Bold and Blunt, and I'm your host, Cheryl Chumley, giving you a Christian conservative look at today's news, politics, culture, and events, and today, religious freedom, the core of individual liberties. Before I get into that, and before I bring on my great guest today, Sam Brownback, a former senator, a former governor, a former secretary of agriculture of Kansas, and also, also an expert in religious freedom because he served as the U.S. ambassador at large for international religious freedom from 2018 to 2021. Before I get into that, I want to give a quick mention of where you can find Bold and Blunt. Of course, at WashingtonTimes.com. Just go to that website and you can find Bold and Blunt in the podcast drawdown menu. And you can subscribe to my twice-weekly Bold and Blunt podcast there, as well as finding my hyperlinked name on WashingtonTimes.com and signing up for my three times a week newsletter, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And you will get in that newsletter all my commentaries that I write all week long at the Washington Times along with Bold and Blunt. But you can also get Bold and Blunt at edify.app backslash podcast. It is the platform for faith-based podcasts. And Bold and Blunt, being a podcast that gives you a Christian conservative point of view, is now offered at that platform. Fits right in. Fits right in. Go to Edify. And of course, you can always get Bold and Blunt wherever podcasts are offered. So let's get on with today's discussion about religious freedom. You know, when you say religious freedom, you think America because America is founded on the principles of religious freedom. That's why people came to this country to start a new place where they can worship freely. I know that the public schools oftentimes overlook the fact that religious freedom and the quest to worship freely was a major founding factor for America. I know that the public school systems like to harp on economic freedom. They don't really like to touch or harp on the idea that America was indeed founded on principles of religious freedom because that actually leads to the logical realization and acknowledgement that the religious freedom that was being sought at the time was a Christian religion. And so a lot of public school systems don't like to harp on that idea. They like to take a more secular approach to America's founding. That being said, those who understand the truths of America's founding and American history know that when you say America, you basically think religious freedom and you think the First Amendment, which guarantees that the government shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And while government in America, even under the Barack Obama administration, even under the Joe Biden administration, even under Democrat control of the House and Senate, while government in America doesn't often make laws that prohibit the free exercise of religion, what often happens is religious persecution anyhow by other means in America. Pew Research Center, Pew Research, in May of 2019, published this report entitled, Many Americans See Religious Discrimination in U.S., in the United States, Especially Against Muslims. I'm going to go ahead and read from this report. It said, Most American adults, 82%, say Muslims are subject to at least some discrimination in the U.S. today. And that's according, again, to 2019 findings published by Pew Research Center, including a majority, 56%, who say Muslims are discriminated against a lot. Among U.S. Muslims themselves, many say they have experienced specific instances of discrimination, including being treated with suspicion, singled out by airport security, or called offensive names. Now, of course, there are some who make the case that since radical Islamic terrorism is conducted by those in the Muslim community of Islamic faith, 
that it only makes sense that say at airports, airport security, that they are targeted. But what about other faiths? What about say Jews? Pew also found that in the 2019 survey, and I'm quoting again from this report, that roughly two thirds of Americans, 64%, also say Jews face at least some discrimination in the US, up, get this, 20 percentage points from the last time this question was asked in 2016. More say Jews face some discrimination than a lot. 39% versus 24%. And in addition, half of Americans, meanwhile, say evangelical Christians suffer at least some discrimination. As with Jews, most people who think evangelicals are discriminated against say they suffer some inequity rather than a lot, 32% versus 18%. So some discrimination versus a lot of discrimination. Well, some is still enough to be concerning in America, land of the free, land that was founded on the quest for religious freedom, land of the recognition of rights coming from God, not government, land of the acknowledgement that among God-given rights, the core basic one is the idea of an individual's right to choose, choose whether, whom, whenever, to worship freely. The point here is that even some religious discrimination in America is way too much. It should be zero. We were founded on Judeo-Christian principles for crying out loud. Religion is wound into our country's DNA. So when you think of religious persecution, really, it, it, it shouldn't be a thought that comes to mind in America. But, and to a lot of Americans, they would be shocked at this Pew Research Center's findings because most Americans think that religious freedom is just something to be expected in America, that there is no persecution. They would scoff and mock the findings of this report because when you say religious persecution, you think over there, you think somewhere else, you think other countries, other nations. And if you listen to America's media, you actually think that the majority of religious persecution takes place at points outside of America and targeted against the Muslim community. But it's actually the Christian community that receives the most religious persecution around the world. The Cato Institute in 2020 wrote this about persecution for one's religion around the world. I quote, Christians face harassment in 143 countries, up from 107 in 2007. So just in a few years time, from 107 countries to 143 countries, Christians face some sort of persecution. Muslims face the same in 140, up from 96. Ironically, the worst treatment of Muslims typically occurs in other Muslim nations, given the Shia-Sunni divide, Cato found. Jews, meanwhile, are abused in 87 countries, up from 51 in 2007. And then listen to this from Cato again. The lower number reflects not greater acceptance, but far fewer people to persecute. Less people, less Christians, fewer Christians, fewer Muslims, fewer Jews. The mistreatment of members of other faiths trails far behind. Government harassment is the bigger problem for Christians, Muslims, and others, while social harassment is more extensive against Jews. So the government goes after Christians and Muslims, while those targeting Jews are just members of society at large. Honestly, I I don't know which is worse. And just a few more statistics. This, this, from the Christian Institute, a headline in January of this year, huge rise in Christian persecution worldwide revealed in 2021 World Watch List. Let me read from this article. More than 
340 million Christians worldwide experienced high levels of persecution in 2020, with 4,761 killed for their faith. The annual World Watch list produced by Christian charity Open Doors showed this is a huge increase on previous years. The 2019 figure, by way of comparison, was around 260 million Christians persecuted for their faith. So from 260 million to 340 million Christians persecuted, that's the increase in one year. Why? What's taking place? The COVID-19 pandemic is what this report found. The report found, I'm quoting from the Christian Institute now, the report found that the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted and exasperated the existing social, economic, and ethnic vulnerabilities of millions of Christians worldwide. So what happens to these people who are persecuted? What happens to these Christians? Well, in India, for example, according to the findings of these reports, more than 100,000 Christians that who were receiving aid from Open Doors' partners, about 80% reported that they were dismissed from food distribution points. Some had to walk miles and hide their Christian identities in order to get the food they needed from these charity groups. The Christian Institute goes on to write, this pattern of discrim discrimination was echoed in many other countries, sometimes by government officials, but more often it was by village heads and committees of other local authorities. The report added that in parts of Nigeria, families with several villages said they received just one-sixth of the rations allocated to Muslim families. So Christian families persecuted by the removal of food distribution, the removal of food from their families' tables. Believe in Jesus? Go hungry in some nations. That seems to be the messaging. And all this comes as China just this month, just this December. Let me read from Reuters. China has barred entry to four people from a U.S. Commission on Religious Freedom. Why? Because the U.S. sanctioned China over human rights abuses. So the four people from the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom are now banned from mainland China. Wow. What is the Joe Biden administration going to do about that? Let's hope they handle that better than they handle Afghanistan. My guest today, Sam Brownback, has a lot to say about religious freedom, the importance of religious freedom to liberty both in America and around the world, and has some insights to offer about what's going on in Afghanistan right now. The mainstream media will have it believed that Afghanistan is moved on. We've moved on. Nothing to see here, folks. Go home. But according to Sam, there's still quite a lot happening in this tribal nation, and American citizens should be very concerned about the betrayal of this White House administration toward our own citizens as well as allies, left suffering, at Christmas time no less, left suffering in Afghanistan. Sam, thank you so much for being on Bold and Blunt. I really appreciate your time. Oh, happy to do it, and congratulations on the new puppy. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm going to love raising this golden doodle. Uh, so you, you as former U.S. ambassador at large for international religious freedom from 2018 to 2021, can you briefly describe what your uh, basic mission with that role was? It was to open the gates of religious freedom around the world and to reduce the uh, persecution of people of faith, of all faiths, of no faith at all. Uh, and to get nations to move towards uh, standing by their uh, UN obligations to human rights, the, one of the basic of which was uh, 
religious freedom for everybody everywhere, including the right to change your faith if you choose to do so. So with that in mind, look at what's happening right now in Afghanistan. There's a new report out from the Associated Press where an Afghan foreign minister just assured the staff at the Associated Press that Taliban rulers are committed to education and jobs for girls and women and tolerance for other religions. How do you respond to that? I, uh, I wish you would show me some evidence. Uh, everything I'm seeing is that people of minority faiths uh, are having to get out. If they don't get out, they're going to be subject to a genocide. I'm co-chairing a loose group of people getting Afghan refugees out, uh, many of them religious minorities, and they, they fear for their lives, and many of them have had family members who have been killed uh, because of being a religious minority. I, it, it just... It's an absurd claim for that individual to make on behalf of a government that appears to me to be doing everything they can to drive religious minorities out, and if they don't leave, to kill them. Let's talk a minute about what you just referenced. You co-chair a group. Can uh, can you give the name of the group? We don't have a name. Okay. Uh, it's just a group of us that came together. All of us were being... Um, contacted by people inside of Afghanistan or had organizations that had uh, people working for us or with us in Afghanistan. A number were uh, operators who had been military uh, in Afghanistan that were helping to get people out that that, uh, that they had worked with while they were there. And this has been one of the most shameful episodes the United States has done in the last several decades because we left our own on the battlefield. Yes. We left and people that had worked with us for us, Western NGOs, religious groups, military, we left them there. And you leave them subject to the whims of the Taliban or ISIS uh, and, and that's what we're working to get them out. It seems like at first there was quite a bit of media attention played to the plight of these poor victims betrayed by this Joe Biden administration, even from the mainstream media, even from leftists in the press. But now that seems to have died down. So you working the front lines to get people out, can you give an example, a couple stories or so of of what you're seeing, of what your partners in, in this saving effort are actually seeing in Afghanistan today? What they're seeing in Afghanistan today is people starving and um, in some cases having to, uh, some people, not in our group, but hearing rumors uh, and seeing the uh, stories of family members, young girls being sold to be child brides so they can get enough food. We're seeing people in our groups, it has a number of people in safe houses hiding. Some of them have been uh, revealed, told by family members and family members killed. Uh, A number of them have uh, slipped out to adjacent countries. We have quite a few that have gotten out into the lily pad nations but can't get and can't find a permanent a third country to take them. Brazil is starting to take a few. The United States takes some. We should take many more uh, from creating this problem. And then uh, many are telling us the worst is yet to come with um, food shortages, medical shortages, winter setting in in Afghanistan. They're really fearful of, uh, of high death toll this winter. Now, when you're talking about people, when you say people, are you referring to American citizens or American allies? How do you characterize that? You know, what what generally we've been dealing with would be American allies. These would be people, Afghans, who worked with U.S. West, US or Western NGOs in Afghanistan during the period of time that, that we were there. A number of them also are religious minorities and a a fair number of religious converts, uh, Muslims that became followers of Jesus uh, and are now in uh, really a dire situation that they will be killed uh, if they leave the safe house that, uh, that they're in. But they're running out of food in the safe house that they're in. And so something's going to have to, uh, have to happen. 
So how do you guys go over there and find these poor victims without alerting Taliban members to their location? You know, I, obviously I'm not going to tell anything specific yeah. uh, on this, but uh, a lot of them uh, have been in contact with Western NGO, particularly Christian uh, NGOs. Some of them have had contact with former military operators who have uh, uh, networks that they've been working with on the ground to move people out of out of the country and into adjacent uh, nations. Uh, some of them that that um, early on got on a number of the flights that Mercury One and others were doing to move them to um, lily pad countries, Abu Dhabi, uh, other places, and now they're. They're stuck in the lily pad countries, and those countries are telling us we won't take more until you get these moved into a, a, a third permanent country status. And that's where we're working aggressively with well, pushing the United States to take more, but also uh, contacting countries like Brazil, Mexico, uh, and then Canada and Australia and others need to take uh, take more as well. So the the... Taliban rulers told the Associated Press that there is no reason why America's government can't trust the Taliban right now, that they want to work not just with America, but with all around the world, and that the United States, for the sake of the suffering right now, excuse me, in Afghanistan, should release the $10 billion in funds that were frozen, uh, that have been frozen from us since August 15th. What would the Taliban do with that ten billion? Do you think? I don't know, but I don't trust them any further than I could throw them. Uh, and their actions and the things that they have done to date do not merit uh, us showing any trust whatsoever uh, to them. They violated agreements, and they don't have control of that country. If the Taliban didn't uh, kill a number of the people, the ISIS would. Uh, this is, we should give humanitarian aid, food and medicine. And we typically have bifurcated uh, things like humanitarian aid from other issues, but I would not give them those resources to malign and abuse. And they're, they're, they've got their Chinese and Russian minders uh, that uh, uh, are using technology uh, to be able to track people down. There's high death toll still taking place. Uh, minorities aren't getting any of the uh, food assistance and help, and in many cases can't even go out in public. They have to stay in hiding. I, this is not a situation we should reward that government whatsoever, and we should keep the pressure on. Is Afghanistan totally lost now? How can the Joe Biden administration uh, reverse the horrors that people there are now experiencing? What can they do? They can let these people that worked with us over there, worked with Western NGOs uh, or our religious minorities, they can let them permanently uh, establish in the United States, come to the U.S. They can push other countries around the world to take uh, them on a permanent basis so we can get the lily pad countries open back up to getting more people there and out of the country before they get hunted down in Afghanistan and killed. Uh, they should open the lily pad countries up and, and uh, for places like Pakistan, refugees from Afghanistan that have gotten out, that worked with Western NGOs uh, or our religious minorities or converts that, that will be killed. You will have a genocide in Afghanistan Uh, the same way you had in northern Iraq with the Yazidis and the Christians, and we pulled our forces back in Iraq under the Obama administration, we got a genocide. You're going to get a genocide uh, in Afghanistan of religious minorities, and they just need to get out now while they can. Well, you... Honestly, Sam, I don't don't hear a lot of talk like that coming from this White House administration. No, they're not saying it at all. They're embarrassed. I would be, too, if I were them. I mean, they they did one of the worst things that I've ever seen. They left our people on the battlefield and left. We don't do that. We make sure our own get off the battlefield. If you're going to fight with us and 
for us. We make sure you get out. And they left them. I, that's an embarrassing situation, that what they did, and they just don't want to be reminded of it. They want to move on to the, to the next issue. Uh, meanwhile, you've got all these people that, that are going to get killed or being killed or hunted down or die of starvation or lack of medicine. And I, it, that's why you've got this ragtag group that we've got and others still working uh, aggressively to move people out of the country that are in harm's way. You know, embarrassment is one thing, but really, this is a phrase that gets tossed around a little bit too much now, but it seems to apply here, that this administration, if they're going to cower in their embarrassment and hope that this all just goes away, it it seems as if they have blood on their hands. I'm, I'm always hesitant to say something like that, but they are responsible for this situation. It would have been, we could have left our people in place they could have at a minimum said we are not leaving Bagram Air Force Base or other bases until everybody that's worked with us or for us uh, gets out that wants out uh, and we're going to see to that Uh, I don't think they should have left and I think there's a reasonable prospect we're going to be back in because it'll become a terrorist state again it's become a PR boondoggle for the Chinese and Russians to say the United States is not reliable. They, they look how they turned on their own yep. people and allies in Afghanistan. And I, I just, <laughs> I think the Biden administration just wants this thing to go away, but it's not going away. And there's people's lives at stake. Yeah. And, you know, so thankfully there are private organizations such as what you described you're partnered with that are picking up the slack of this administration and doing the life-saving work uh, that's so desperately needed. And I know we only have a couple minutes left, but I did want to jump to Nigeria because there was an interesting movement that took place between the administrations. Mike Pompeo had added Nigeria to the countries of particular concern on religious freedom the CPC list. And this administration just recently removed Nigeria from that list. Could you explain the importance of having Nigeria on the CPC list and what its removal means? It's the next caliphate or militant Islamic uh, fundamentalist. Northern Nigeria, Sahel region is a terrorist convention now. All the major most of the major global and regional terrorist organizations are funding or working in that region now. And by taking it off the list, it's saying, no, we don't think this is a major problem. Religion's not an issue. And militant Islamic fundamentalists, their core issue is religion. It's the misuse of of Islam, but they're using it. And you can't just wish it away by ignoring it. In this case, I think you just you saw people going, no, 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 we're, we, we think if we don't call it a religious division, it won't be one. And of course, that's <laughs> ludicrous. Well, let me just finish with this question, because there are a lot of Americans, a lot of Christians in this country that as we head into this Christmas season, their hearts go out to those suffering around the world. What can people do? Uh, what can American citizens do to help the, the suffering in Afghanistan or Nigeria right now? Do you have any words of advice? You know, I, I, first and foremost, to start with prayer and praying for people and then find a group. Uh, I'm uh, a senior fellow with Open Doors USA, and they work with Great uh, group. Yep. people on the ground uh, in these countries to support them. Group the Samaritan's Purse. Uh, it, uh, does a lot of work for people on the ground or find your own group of uh, Catholic charities that uh, that works and, and direct your giving to those that are persecuted around the world. The level of Christian persecution now is the highest in human history uh, and a lot of people being killed and I, I just pray for them and if you can see fit to give some money to them please do. Those are three great groups that you just listed. Sam Brownback, I want to thank you for your time on Bold and Blunt, and more importantly, thank you for the work you do to help these poor victims. And you know what? Merry Christmas to you and your family. Merry Christmas to you, and best 
to you and that new puppy. <laughs> Thank you so much. So if you listen to the whole show, I know you must be wondering, what is this reference to this new puppy? Well, I have this new puppy. His name is Mickey, Mickey O'Rourke, his full name. And he is a uh, golden doodle and he's about four months old. And at the time of interview with Sam, I had just got him. I, I just brought him home just a couple days. And so he was sitting under my feet as the phone rang, as Sam called in, and I was very distracted by what he was playing with. And when I answered the phone, I answered very informally. Instead of saying, hi, this is Cheryl Chumley with Bold and Blunt, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. I basically just said, hello, this is Cheryl. And then a few seconds later, I gave him a heads up that I was about to hit record. And so Sam, rightfully so, basically asked, well, to whom am I speaking? And so, I told him the story of my golden doodle. And so there you have it. You have the full story, you have the back story, you have the front story, you have the entire story of my golden doodle and religious freedom in America. What a great show, what a great show. And if you want more of Bold and Blunt great shows, make sure you go to WashingtonTimes.com and check out the podcast, check out my commentaries and subscribe if you would to my three times a week newsletter to get all my commentaries and my Bold and Blunt podcast delivered right to your email box. And you can also get Bold and Blunt, of course, at edify.app backslash podcast, the platform for all your faith-based podcasts, not just Bold and Blunt, but tons more. Check out all the offerings they have there. And look, religious freedom, it's not just a talking point. It's the basis of all liberties in America and around the world. Without religious freedom, you've got nothing. Merry Christmas to you. Tune in next time. And in the meanwhile, don't forget, stay blunt, stay bold.